For those who uh, don't know, um, we've just launched a brand new teaching series that started last week from Matthew, and we're going to take some serious time over this. Now, if you've done the maths, you were probably already thinking, you know, is he thinking three months? Is he thinking four months when he says some serious time? But if we're going to, you know, as Carl said, there's kind of nine parables in one chapter, there's a good chance we're going to preach on every parable. Plus the res, 28 chapters in Matthew, we're going to take some serious time over this book. So, but we are in Matthew 2 this week, so we've done one and two in two weeks. But that's not always going to be the case, just as a little kind of precursor and a bit of a warning. Uh, but the whole idea is we've done Acts, we kind of got some cultural stuff into the life of the church. We did topical stuff with 20 questions. But really, this, this series, Matthew, the Jesus story, we want to kind of just actually look at the life of Jesus, who he was, what he was about, what he stood for and what he's done for us. Because actually, I mean, that's the, that's the gospel. That's what we're here for. That's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. And Matthew paints a very vivid picture of this Jesus story. Um, Carl went into a bit of detail last week that Matthew is this tax-collecting sinner. That's what you have to remember is he's the writer. He, he's viewed by the Pharisees and the religious people as a sinner. And yet here's the guy who's penning this gospel. And... Um, He's writing to a Jewish audience, and um, what we find in today's, when we read Matthew chapter 2, I'm going to read the whole of it, but in two sections, if you've got a Bible, it's worth looking at, because what actually we see is when you actually read the Bible, it's very different to our experience. When we come at Christmas and we think about Christmas, we have this kind of picture in our head, don't we? But when you actually read the Bible, it's nothing like what we have in the Nativity, They're so poles apart. I don't even know how they got to what we have as nativity scenes. You know, we've all been in plays, probably. I grew up as a kid. I had blonde hair. Can you believe it? And I was always an angel, probably because I wasn't very good at acting. But then I got my moment when I was about 17 or 18, and I was past it, and we did this kind of play. And I was Herod. I was the evil genius, which I think I did quite well. Um, But you know, know, when you think of the nativity, you you know, donkeys watching on. Everything's so peaceful and perfect. There's the shepherds and there's the angels and it's all lovely. And then in in chapter 2 of Matthew, it's when the wise men come and you always have it, don't you? They always parade on with their little hats and there's three of them and they've got these gifts and they bring in the lovely gifts and there's this kind of sweet little fairy tale of how it all happened. It's like, it reminds me of the carol, this, away in a manger. The cattle are lowing, I'm not going to sing it, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Really? I mean, I think that song should be banned. It's just rubbish. He's a baby. There's going to be screaming. There's going to be pooing. There's going to be mess. There's going to be animals causing mess. It's poor. It's gritty. It's rugged. You know, if we wrote carols actually based upon Matthew Matthew 2 and Luke, I mean, they probably wouldn't be very poetic. But maybe we should do that. You know, and it was gritty, and it was nasty, and it was poor. I mean, I don't know if words rhyme with those things, but that's what we kind of read here. It's a challenging, realistic version of what we have. The nativity, I want you to forget about that. I want you to just hear the words of what I'm going to say this morning. I mean, no birth scene is nice, is it? I mean, I've been at two. Neither of them were pleasure. I mean... I was watching on, but it wasn't nice. It's birth. It's, it's messy. And here is more than that going on, though, as we read the text. It's not the picture we conjure up, but more than it being this birth scene and the entrance, it's God playing his hand. It's the ace up his sleeve, if you like. The whole of the Bible story, the whole of history has been building to this moment in time when the Son of God becomes a baby boy. The Son of God, the eternal Son of God, becomes human. It's staggering. We kind of just brush out, but it's staggering. The one who has always been and has been forever and had no time upon him, he was eternal, enters into time and space, has a life, has a birthday. And it's the beginning of the end for God's enemies. The creator of Mary and Joseph is born of Mary. It's staggering. And there's just this vulnerability that I can't get past. 
the vulnerability of this little baby. You see a little baby, they're so dependent upon their parents or their carers or whoever it is that's looking after them. There's a real vulnerability there, isn't it? They can't survive without help. The creator of the universe needs the help of those that have been created in order to be sustained and continue. It's remarkable. There is a, a, a huge risk, if you like, in one sense, a huge vulnerability going on here as this baby is born. And even in Matthew 2, as these wise men approach and they go to Herod, they say this. They say they're looking for this baby Jesus, the one called King of the Jews. The same thing that's nailed above his cross is there in chapter 2. Right from the beginning, it's really clear who this guy is and what he's come for. Why don't we just read it? Matthew 2, 1 to 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Don't think just a normal star here. This is some sort of supernatural light or shooting star or event that they can track through the star. It's not something regular. This is divine. It's supernatural. A star appears and they follow it. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Don't you love that when you read the Old Testament and then in the New Testament they make sense of verses that you were reading going, what on earth does that mean? And then in Jesus it makes perfect sense. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly. Always secret, you know, people that do a bit of evil. It's always secret. Uh, and ascertained from them what the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Yeah, right. We know what he's up to. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. So this supernatural event stops doesn't continue. So that's how we know it's supernatural. It's not just any old star. It stops moving in the perfect place, in the perfect location. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now you'll see there at the start of Matthew 2, Matthew 1, you have uh, the genealogy as Carl went through, and then you have the birth of Jesus. And so Matthew picks up in chapter 2, it starts straight on, it kind of says, and after Jesus was born, it's assuming that we've read the bit beforehand, he throws in this word, behold. Now whenever, Matthew does this a lot, but whenever he throws in the word, behold, we need to stop and go, okay, something really, really, really important is about to reveal, because he's saying, behold, it's like a, an announcement here is something that should hold your attention. Here is something that maybe will shock you or surprise you. And then he says, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? And you're thinking, what? Why is this shocking, Matthew? I mean, the wise men, they come to Jesus every Christmas. We see them with their little hats and they bring their gold and their frankincense and their myrrh. There's just a couple of observations. I don't know why we have three. I think probably based on the fact that there's three gifts. But I want you to picture here a bit more of an entourage. It's not going to be three men. There's going to be more than that. There's going to be their entourage and their, their servants and their helpers. There may have been five wise men, six wise men. We don't know. I think we just picked three because they bought three gifts. So there may have been more than that. We just don't know. But that's the first thing to say. Um, we can lose that notion and lose that pretty image as well. Um, but also that they're wise men. I've been in some plays where I think they've been short of boys, so girls have played it. It's been wise women. It's not wise women, they're wise men. They are men from the East, and they are not kings. I know there's that, another terrible Christmas carol, We Three Kings of Orient Are. I don't, they're not kings. They're wise men. The Greek here, uh, my Greek's not great, but it's, it's like magi or magoi which refers to experts in mysteries of Persia and Babylon. That's the word that Matthew uses when he says wise men. They are experts in mysteries. 
that would be Persia and Babylon. So in other words, Magi is an ancient word that referred to pagan astrologers, people that would study the sky. And actually, more than that, these people that studied the sky back then dabbled in the dark arts, did some mysterious stuff, did some stupid stuff. And that's where we get the English word magic from. This word wise men, they were literally like magicians. They were sorcerers. They are more close to sorcerers or magicians than they are kings. Okay, so they're not kings at all, but they are wise men from the east. And he's saying this, in effect. Matthew is saying, behold, wizards are coming. Gandalf the Grey is here. And they're coming to worship Jesus. These specialists in the pagan arts of astrology and reading the sky. Now, I mean, just on a side, you know, if you do zodiac signs, give me a break. I'll tell you what the stars mean. They mean God is the creator of the universe and we're to glorify him. They don't tell you your life. But these guys studied the sky and felt that in some way they could learn things. And on this occasion, they learn to follow a star because they're told by God. And they do it and they worship Jesus. But they're into magic. They're into dark arts. Do you know what the Bible says about people that do magic and dark arts? It's not very complimentary. Isaiah has a go. Jeremiah has a go. They condemn it. This is sinful. This is evil. Both Peter and Paul in Acts are like, what are you doing? This is wrong. They burn all their magic books because they've met Jesus at one point. They sort out the magi magicians. So what you have here, in effect, is sinful people, sinners, in the eyes of the Jews. Remember how the Jews would take this? Men, wise men from the east, coming and spending time with Jesus. This is not then the Christmas card picture we have, is it? It's very different. This is wicked, evil men coming to Jesus and bringing gifts. To a Jewish audience, it would be shocking in the fact that it's non-Jews coming in the first place. I mean, shepherds, okay, but they're a bit rough and ready. But people from Persia or Babylon, strangers, and worse than that, like magic people, why weren't we invited? Why weren't we told where Jesus was being born? We're the Pharisees. We're the religious ones. We know the scriptures really well. But these foreigners... What's going on here? These blatant sinners coming into the presence of the one referred to as king of the Jews. We already know they're not happy. This is verse 2. Um, For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And notice this. And all Jerusalem with him was troubled. And assembling all the chief priests and all the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So it's not just Herod who's upset, it's all his religious leaders, all his corrupt politicians, all his power-hungry people are not happy. And more than that, there's wise men for the East that seem to have got a memo about where Jesus is and they haven't received it. They weren't invited into his presence or they haven't, they haven't got the memo as to where he's located. But these guys from the East have. And this is the game changer really for us. And it's good news for us because I'm guessing none of us are Jewish. I'm going to assume there may be some Jewish blood here. I don't know. But the Messiah, if you read the Old Testament, it always been the Messiah been for the Jewish people. That's what they were holding for, their hero. The guy who was going to rescue them. They're waiting for the Savior. Well, it turns out that this Savior is not only just for them, but for the nations. And even in his birth, it's displayed. All the world can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. No one is too far off. No one is beyond grace. Not even these magicians from Persia and Babylon. Not even these people that have got a massively checkered past. You know, if we actually realize that it's not these three kings from Orient are, and it's these guys, these wise men, it brings hope for you and I, actually, that we can be invited into the presence of Jesus. No matter where we're from, what we've done, what we will do, how unworthy we feel. This is not a case of this story is too good to be true. But it's the good news that whether we've done dark arts or not, whether we've been messed up in some stuff or not, that our hearts are full of darkness, 
but actually that can be changed as we meet with Jesus. We can choose willingly, just as these wise men did, to almost lay down their wisdom and their whatever it is that they hold to and bow and worship before Jesus. That's what they did. That's what they traveled so far to do, that they would come into his presence and they would bow down and worship before him. And you kind of go, what's well, all happily ever after from that point, isn't it? Everything's great. The picture on our Christmas card is complete. Everybody's made it. But then we learn a little bit more about Herod, who, in contrast to the Magi, who we get the sense that, you know, the, they've come and they've come into his presence and they recognize who Jesus is. We have Herod. This is what it says. This is uh, chapter 2 from 13 to the end of the chapter. When they departed, um, because that's speaking of the wise men, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region who were under two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea, in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. We meet Herod a little bit more there, don't we? He's this self-appointed ruler under, uh, under the Romans for a region. He's not like Jesus, who's been born a king, Herod has fought his way to the top and appointed himself king of the people. Um, one of his names is Herod the Great. That's what he's known as in history. But we, we know uh, in extra biblical uh, documentation and history books a little bit more about Herod the Great. Let me tell you a little bit about why he was so great. This is a nice little CV he's got here. He murdered his own wife. Apparently, it was his favorite wife. Now, I don't know what that means for his wives that weren't as good as this one, but she got murdered. Um, he, had, uh, he murdered three of his own sons. Um, he also, let's just assume, because we all think this, that the mother-in-law got it. Um, we're not told that, I'm just assuming. Um, and he built tons of stuff as well. So he built palaces, he built temples, he, lots of grand buildings that, you know, Oh, Herod built that. Herod, he's famous. Herod, he's great. All to kind of massage his own ego. Um, he thought he was pretty awesome. He sounds nice, doesn't he? You know, he murders his own kids. I can even contemplate. I can't, I can't get my head around that. But here is a man, I want you to understand this. Here is a man who has built his life around being the king, about having a throne. And then when it comes under threat, even by perceiving his own kids to threaten his rule, he just knocks them on the head. Because he wants to protect all that he has earned, all that he has strived for. You see, that's his identity, isn't it? He is the king, nobody else is. And it's his curse. It curses him because he can't think about anybody other than himself. And just as on a side, if our identity is not we're a child of God, loved by Jesus, then it's in something else. You know, if, if our mission in life is to look beautiful, then when you get old, it's going to be a bit of a crisis for you. Isn't it? Oh, what am I going to do? I'm getting older. Or if it's in relationships, our identity is in having amazing relationships and we look like the model couple. What happens when there's problems there? Our world falls apart. Or if it's in health, well, what happens when we get sick? Does our life crash down? Herod's identity is king and his world revolves around it. 
And it's just a little question that kind of got me thinking, well, what does our world revolve around? Is it, I'm a child of God, I'm loved by Jesus, so therefore everything else, okay. Or is it something else? What is our life built upon? Herod is not the model human being. If you want to kind of uh, live a, a life that honors God, don't follow Herod's example. He's like the opposite extreme. We read further to, if, if killing his favorite wife and his three sons wasn't enough, we also learn he's into mass murder. He's into genocide. Because his identity is threatened by this so-called king of the Jews. The wise men have been to see him, and instead of returning as instructed, they get a dream, and they head home by a different way. And from verse 16, we read that Herod kills every boy under two in the Bethlehem region. Now, at the time, Bethlehem, they estimate, would have been around a population of around about 1,000 people, give or take, you know, a few here, a few there, um, and the surrounding villages. So if you do the kind of general kind of maths, you're looking at between 20 and 30 under two-year-old boys. Collateral damage for Herod, as long as he gets Jesus. He wants to take them out in the hope that one of them will be the king of the Jews and his throne won't be threatened. Now both the Magi and Herod at some point in their lives have made reckless decisions, have done some suspect things, but there's a massive difference, isn't there? Some of them choose to bow down and worship, and the other demands worship. The other demands to be the king still. The Magi choose to honor Jesus Christ even in his birth, even though they don't necessarily understand who he's fully going to be or what he's going to do. But they choose life, whereas Herod ultimately chooses death. And I want to just say this, that the way of Jesus brings life. If we follow after Christ, if we speak of Christ, if we live like Christ, it will bring life to you, but it will bring life to others. The opposite of that is death. And Satan is the one who brings death. And Satan wants nothing more than for death to reign and for less people to have this life of Christ. That's his mission. Crush Jesus. Crush Jesus. Crush his people. I can't crush Jesus. Okay, what can I go for? I'll go for his people. And even here we see him using Herod to try and crush this plan in its infancy. You know, we face a choice every day as to whether we are going to bring death or life to people. Now, I don't mean literally. <laughs> I don't, um, we have that power, I suppose, as to what we do. But what I mean by that is the words that we speak, are they bringing life to people or are they bringing death? Are we encouraging or discouraging? Are we honoring or dishonoring? Because we're going to be held account for our actions. We're going to be held account for the things that we say. Do our lives build up or do they destroy? We have to just kind of take a step back and go, what am I doing with my life choices? Who am I living for? Who am I representing? You see, because the war, that's the title of this, that the, the, the war begins. The war that started here now rages in our hearts between darkness and light, between honoring God and honoring ourselves. And we have a choice, don't we? Every day we have a choice. Will we honor God today or will we do something else? We don't make uninformed decisions, though. We have the truth of Scripture. And I want to just highlight this to you. You'll notice in verses 13 to 23, which I read a moment ago, that the word fulfill or fulfillment comes up three times. It's almost as if Matthew says, blah, 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 in order to fulfill what Hosea has said. Or this took place so that the words of Jeremiah are true. This has been fulfilled, this has been fulfilled, this has been fulfilled. Matthew goes to great lengths, not just in chapter 2, but throughout the whole of his book. And you've got to remember, he's writing to a Jewish audience who would know the Old Testament really well. To say, all these prophecies, all these things that were written in the Old Testament, they're about this guy. They're about Jesus. Even in his birth, they're about Jesus the truth and the promises of who he is. And it tells you a lot about the Bible, doesn't it, if that's the case. that You know, I hear this said all the time, please don't, um, please don't go and tell someone off if they said this, but the Bible is not a handbook. The Bible is not a roadmap. 
It's a story about Jesus. That's what it is primarily. It's the story of God and how we can be rescued. The Old and the New Testament. Not just the New Testament, not just the Gospels, but Jeremiah, Hosea. Passages quoted in today's passage. It's all about Jesus. And that means that all of Scripture is important. Even those obscure passages that don't seem to make sense. But if we read Jesus back into it, if we go, okay, well... Matthew's saying this is about Jesus. Oh, now that verse in Hosea 11, 1 makes perfect sense. Because in Jesus Christ, it makes sense. Otherwise, it just didn't mean anything to me. But he's talking about Jesus. You know, our responsibility is we are God's messengers in one sense. We communicate the truth of Scripture. We are not God's editors. We are not to edit scripture so that it pleases our worldview, but rather we are to communicate the truth as it is. We start editing it, you start messing around with it. You, I mean, we lose who God is, we lose the story of who Jesus is. But we are to communicate it, we are to be his messengers. It's God's perfect word, perfect word. That means we don't need to play with it. We don't need to add bits to it or take bits away. It's all we need to know about Jesus for salvation and much more. And what that means is when God speaks, when God speaks in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it should inspire us that this is really all about Jesus. That means, that means Leviticus can be interesting. That means 1 and 2 Chronicles, after you've read 1 and 2 Kings, can actually mean something. That actually we don't need to have a snooze fest and skip over genealogies because they teach us something of who God is and his plans for us. Everything we need to know, what's right, what's wrong, how to live, can be found in Scripture, can be found there. God tells us how to do those things. We've just got to learn to adhere to it and obey him. And you know why we need this? We don't just need this because obviously we need to hear from God, but we need it because life is hard, because life is difficult, because on a daily basis we face these times to make decisions don't we we have this opportunity to honor God or dishonor him and we need help in making those decisions we need the spirit of God we need the word of God to guide us and teach us and show us and you know what Satan is real he is real he's not he's not a made-up guy with two little horns and a forked tail and a fork over here that's not but he's real he's fallen angel and he wants he wants to cause us to fall and trip up. If we're a Christian, the reality is that Satan hates us. He hates us because of who we have in our heart. He hates Jesus, so he hates Jesus' people. And he will try and derail. But I always take it as kind of, a, kind of a backhanded compliment in one sense. You know, if I feel a bit of resistance, and it's fairly obvious that the enemy is trying to kind of disrupt what's going on, I kind of take it as a bit of a compliment. <laughs> Obviously, we're doing the right things here. Obviously, we're building the kingdom. Because he's not going to bother with me if I'm just sat being lazy in my chair doing nothing. I'm sorted. I'm no threat to his kingdom. I'm not going to push back the darkness. But if we're stepping out in faith, if we're doing stuff for God, if we're living for him and we are communicating life to people, we're going to come up against resistance at work, resistance at home, resistance at school. Because that's how the enemy works. Just look here at this passage. God takes incredible lengths to demonstrate that he's in control and that he can be trusted despite opposition. On four occasions in these verses, either an angel or a dream intercepts Mary and Joseph and says, you need to go here, you need to go there, you need to stop what you're doing. You know, just by reading this passage, we should know that following Jesus is not going to be easy. But actually, Jesus never said following me is going to be easy and be rainbows and butterflies. We don't follow him for an easy life, but we follow him because we'll have everlasting life. We'll have new life. We have renewed hope. For Mary and Joseph, this was probably hard. Remember, they're teenagers. New to the parenting game. And then an angel says this in verse 13. When they had departed, behold, that's that word again. So what, what he says is important. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and its mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. It's amazing, really. 
An angel intercepts and says, you need to take everything that you have and you need to leave right now. Because the king, he wants to kill you. <laughs> he wants to kill your son. You can't stay here. Tell you what, go to Egypt. But I'm not going to tell you how long you're going to go to Egypt. But go there until I tell you to come back. Can you imagine if that happened today? An angel appeared and said, I need you to leave Chesterfield right now. I need to take all your hair, I need to go right now. And I need you to go to Yorkshire until an unspecified date. That'd be a nightmare. What would you do? You'd start going, what? Well, I can't do that. I've got to get my paperwork in order. What about my car? What about my family? What about my friends? What about school? What about income? What am I going to do? I've got a job. I'm a carpenter, don't you know? I've got a trade. I've got orders to fulfill. I've got people who are relying on me. In one sense, he says, leave your friends, leave your family, go to Egypt. It could be years. The angel doesn't say. This is a big deal, isn't it? For two teenagers with a young baby. What an amazing responsibility God gives them. God entrusts them with his son to actually do what has been asked of him. And they do it even when it's hard. You know, for those who follow Jesus, for those who go with him, life is hard. We sign up for a tough life, not because it's the way it is, but we are choosing to align ourselves with Jesus. What happened to Jesus? He was beaten, he was spat on, he was embarrassed, he was mocked, he was crucified. That's who we're aligning ourselves with. The one who is rejected by the world, but the one who saves anybody who puts their trust in him. And it was the same for Mary and Joseph. And that's why as you read through the Psalms, you get this kind of frustration of like Asaph and David as they're going, why, God, does it seem like the evil man is prospering? You know, they're so wealthy and they've got all this stuff. And here I am with nothing. And it's almost as if you say, what do you mean you've got nothing? You've got me. Actually, they're like the grass. They will wither and they will die. But if you know me, you have everlasting life. The grass here today, gone tomorrow. What matters for us is things of eternal worth. There is going to be a resistance for us. Let's not have our heads in the sand, you know. Life is hard. Relationships need work. Loving people, loving your enemies. You know, that is not easy, is it? That is hard. Emotionally, life is hard. Spiritually, it can be difficult. Physically, financially, it could be difficult. You know, every alley you can think of is going to be hard because Satan wants to drag us down and destroy our witness. So what do we do when life is difficult? Because it will be. You know, we look to Jesus' example, but also here, God says to Joseph, just go. Go. Go to another country. Take a risky 80-mile journey to Egypt. You know, it got me thinking, how did Joseph feel about this? How did Mary feel about it? Did they have a debate about the pros and cons? And, you know, oh, we need a moving date, and life has to stop because we're moving house, and, you know, we need to write letters to our friends and family so they know where we've gone. Or shall I have a bit of a moan? You know, we don't read any of that. There's none of that there. Did Joseph check his roots and consult his mates? We've got to assume that he just actually put into practice what God told him to do. That he just got on with it. He didn't moan. He didn't whinge. He just did it. He followed because he had the faith to believe that God was greater than the resistance that he was facing. And that's true for us. Whatever resistance we feel like we're facing from the enemy, that God is greater. You know, sometimes we have to just take that step of faith, don't we? You know, a lot of the time, I feel like as Christians, we're waiting. We feel like we're just waiting for God to kind of blow us out of the water with this divine moment that answers all of our questions. You know, what am I going to do with my life? What job should I have? Where should I move? You know, maybe Mary and Joseph had been asking for stuff. Maybe the dream was to settle down, have a nice little house by the river with a white picket fence and have lots of children and live happily ever after. And that was the vision. Oh, we could stay in Bethlehem. That would be lovely. It's a nice place to live. It's not too crowded. It's got everything we need. Maybe that's what they wanted. 
Maybe that's the conversations they were having. But you've just got to sometimes just step out with that step of faith and just do what God asks us to do. You know, if we spend our whole life waiting for an answer or waiting for this moment, you know, we'll never leave the blocks. We'll never do mission. We'll never actually advance the kingdom because we'll just sit around waiting. Sometimes we have to take that step of faith. And when we do, God meets us there. Mary and Joseph had to leave their home, had to leave everything. And that was a step of faith for them as teenagers. Those of you who've got teenagers, can you imagine? And they had to just take that step of faith. And God met them as they did that. Here Joseph leaves his possessions, his home, his family, his comfort, his security, his employment, his finance. He leaves everything because God tells him to. Everything. Some of you are facing uncertainty in your future. Like I said, what to do for work? What to do with your family? What to buy? You know, God is less concerned about giving us what we want and more concerned with our relationship with him. So often we think it's about the stuff that we amass. Where am I going to live? What am I going to do? He wants your heart. It's not bothered about the stuff. What you do for a living, you know. It's like whatever we do, we can glorify God in it. He doesn't give us what we want, but he gives us what we need. He didn't give Mary and Joseph all his answers, but what did he give them? He gave them his son. You know, they left, they took that step of faith, but who went with them? Even as a baby, who was with them? Jesus Christ was with them. And that was more important than everything else, their finance, their home, their family. Dare I say that? Knowing Jesus and having Jesus with them was the most important thing. So they had no mortgage. They had no car. They had no friends. No education. He had a rubbish job. They were poor. They had to leave to a foreign country. They had no parenting books or instruction manuals or help. All they had was some myrrh, some frankincense, and some gold that probably they traded in so that they would have food on the table when they're in Egypt. Or even traded in to get them there. But you know what? They had Jesus. The most important thing in our life is not what we do. It's not even where we are, but it's who goes with us. It's not where we are on the journey. It's not whether we've got all our answers or not, but it's who's with us on it. That is the most important thing. Are we positioning ourselves to honor God and live for him and know Christ above everything else? Jesus was with Mary and Joseph, and he can be with us too. You see, in him, actually, the reality is, in Jesus, we have everything. And even in Matthew chapter 2, that is the point he is trying to get across. If you've got Jesus, you've got everything. Without him, you truly have nothing. 